I'm Simon Leach, and I launched this podcast to share the journey of inspiring leaders who are creating a healthy and sustainable impact on the world. And in today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Dexter Payne. Dexter is uh, chairman and founding partner of Payne Schwartz uh, Partners, a specialist private equity investor uh, specializing in sustainable food and ag, um, deployed um, over $5 billion uh, worth of capital and uh, across 60 investments over a, well, uh, over a 15 year period, I think, with uh, Payne and Schwartz, but a 30 year career in, uh, in food and ag. Um, Dexter has chaired many public and private uh, uh, companies, is a, long, a lifelong sports fan, and he served as the uh, chairman of the US Olympic governing body for 13 years. And I think since 2014, a member of the International Ski Federation. And, uh, and this year was recognized with the Julius Blagan Award for Lifetime Services to US Skiing. And I met Dexter back in March, actually, in London. It was the, the last business meeting I had. He kindly invited me to his hotel. We had a wonderful uh, breakfast together. And Dexter, look, welcome to the show. Thanks for, thanks for agreeing to come on. Simon, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it was my uh, last business trip before being <laughs> grounded. So uh, uh, sort of appropriate way to kick things off again, hopefully, as we get uh, back to uh, business more as normal than it definitely. has been. No, definitely. And, uh, and I would say I haven't had a breakfast actually like the one we had, actually. It really was a uh, you know, a wonderful experience, actually. And, uh, and how, I mean, how, how, have you, how have you generally found the kind of lockdown from the viewpoint of the impact it's had on, on, on you? Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm actually in my office today and I'm planning to spend uh, time here over the next three days. Uh, it's nice to be back in the office, uh, first time uh, since March. Um, very quiet, I'm the uh, only one in here and so uh, uh, you know it's um, been nice to get work done and to uh, um, you know be able to use all the things that uh, I for so long have taken for granted uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, but look uh, I think being an investor in food and agribusiness um, we've actually been lucky it's an incredibly resilient um, industry and I think we've seen it be um, more resilient um, than we even thought it might be um, when we uh, raised our funds. Um, you know, over the last six months, we're, we're, we've worked very hard with our portfolio companies. And quite frankly, we've seen very few issues. Uh, we had one portfolio company whose largest customers were uh, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, um, and they obviously took a significant hit in uh, the April and May time period, but we've actually seen that business bounce back uh, to actually budgeted levels of performance uh, during the summer. Um, the rest of our portfolio really hasn't been impacted. I mean, one of the great things is people have had to eat, actually, they've actually eaten more uh, of what they've purchased through retail channels. Um, and most of our business actually produce uh, products that end up in retail channels. So um, we've been pleasantly surprised with the performance mm. of our businesses. A number of our businesses actually are at or above originally budgeted levels. Uh, and uh, we've made a couple of investments. Um, one, our last one was in July. Uh, I think the challenging thing for our business, uh, the private equity business as a whole, is historically we've been quite used to going out and spending an enormous amount of times with the management teams and the, yeah. company and the sellers. Um, and it's been a difficult period to have face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and while Zoom has proven to be incredibly efficient, um, we've yet to make an investment where our relationship was uh, initiated, developed and nurtured over Zoom. We haven't yet gotten to that point. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's a place that we probably um, have had the biggest struggle in terms of uh, uh, a firm is putting capital to work. Got it. Yeah, I can, I can understand. And just from your personal perspective, how, how much time normally would you spend on the road traveling, um, you know, around the world um, compared to, 
you know, post uh, kind of lockdown, as it were. Well, let me give a little bit of background. Um, Payne Schwartz is a firm um, that was founded 20 plus years ago. We're the largest uh, focused investor on food and agribusiness globally. And because of that, um, we actually spend time um, traveling internationally. Uh, our offices are in New York and San Francisco, but our portfolio ranges from Australia, North America, and Europe. Uh, with about 60% of the portfolio being in North America and the remaining 40% being either in uh, Australia or Europe. Um, you know, I think prior to COVID, I spent uh, 60 plus percent of my time on the road. Um, that consisted of going out and meeting new companies uh, to invest in, as well as working very closely with our existing portfolio com of companies. So companies that I have responsibility for are based in Norway, Poland, uh, the US, um, you know, pretty broad geographic footprint. Uh, mm. And we try to spend an enormous amount of time with our portfolio companies. Uh, you know, one of our basic underlying approaches to investing is when we buy a business, we want the business to be a better business when we sell it than it was when we bought it. And that only happens when you work really actively with your portfolio companies. Yeah, yeah. So how many board seats do you, how many board positions do you currently have at the moment, you personally? So I sit on five uh, corporate boards uh, in our portfolio. Uh, and then I sit on a couple of other not-for-profit boards. Um, and those portfolio companies, board meetings are four times a year. I think one of the things we've learned from COVID is uh, to be a bit more efficient around those board meetings. So uh, historically, we've done those four board meetings uh, on site for our portfolio companies. I think we've come to the conclusion that during uh, the going forward, uh, you know, doing two board meetings by Zoom and two board meetings in person probably is sufficient. Um, it is always good to go see our companies um, on location to spend time uh, with the management teams in person. But I think we believe we can be more efficient in terms of both travel uh, and the cost, uh, both time and money, um, with our existing portfolio by using Zoom, something we really hadn't done before. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? It really is. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's certainly a, a changing landscape, that's for sure. And. Uh, Tell me, interesting, just um, on some research before we had this uh, conversation, we, we, we mentioned around the, you know, your affiliation and your love of skiing, as it were. And is it right that you've attended literally every Olympics and nearly all world championships over the past 17 years? Uh, it is. Um, Winter Olympics. Um, yes. Not, uh, I'm not as avid uh, a spectator at Summer Olympics. Um, but during the last uh, 20 years or so, I've attended, I think, almost all of the world championships in uh, cross-country, alpine, freestyle, free ski, snowboard, um, as well as all the Olympics. Um, I am a passionate um, mm. editor. Uh, I grew up ski racing. Uh, I've been able to give back uh, as chairman of the U.S. ski team. I've also been able to give back uh, being involved um, on the International Ski Federation Council uh, and uh, really enjoy um, sport. Um, you know, while I've been particularly involved with uh, winter sports, I also sit on the U.S. Uh, biathlon board. Um, I am a general sports fan and avid uh, sports fan. So... It, it is a, you know, when you work as hard as we do uh, in our business, um, it's nice to have outlets and between sports and family, um, it's a great way to spend time when I'm not working. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. You mentioned the time, you know, we have four, 1,440 minutes in the day. I suppose when you're founding the, the company and, you know, you're running and building a, you know, successful private equity um, Adventure, not, not everyone can find the balance and find the time actually to to give to 
true passions and love, actually. So, you know, a couple of questions for you. How have you managed to do that? Is that something you've learned and developed as you've grown in your career? Or is that something you always have that innate ability to be able to manage? Um, you know, isn't that the um, key question to life, which is how do you manage all these uh, um, things that you're passionate about, but take time. So managing family, um, you know, your sport passions, business. Uh, you know, I think that it's a constantly changing time. You know, I'm lucky in that my kids are now grown and through college. So I have more time to spend with my wife, more time to spend on my passions, uh, and more time to spend in the business. You know, there were times when, um, you had to spend uh, a lot of time on, you know, family activities. When I had three kids in school who were avid uh, uh, competitors, as well as, um, you know, taking time to attend uh, lots of school outings. Uh, you know, I think it ebbs and flows over time. And just trying to balance that is always challenging. I do consider myself to be fairly efficient uh, in terms of trying to get through uh, what needs to be done uh, and trying to be efficient about what I spend time on and what I don't spend time on. Um, but uh, I think it is one of the key challenges to life is balancing all those different competing interests that we all have day to day. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, do, the kid, do your kids all ski? Are they competitive skiers? Um, my kids are all... Um, active skiers and they're all very good skiers. Uh, but none of them were uh, passionate ski racers. Um, my eldest was the closest and she ended up uh, being injured in a couple of different accidents and uh, discovered horses. Um, and then my other two are both very good skiers, uh, but weren't avid competitors. Got it. Yeah, got it. And, and tell me, what, what was it about? Because I, I remember reading about you got into it when you were two. I read the story, you first started skiing, I think when you were two, right? And, uh, you know, clearly it was a love affair that happened very early in your life. Well, what was it, can you explain what, what, it, what it was that took your heart away, that really kind of, that you wanted to dedicate a life of passion towards it? To work? Um, you know, I grew up in a small town in Northern New Hampshire and um, within 10 minutes of my house were five different ski areas. Uh, both my parents skied. Uh, my dad had been a competitive skier. Uh, and so it was just a very natural thing for me to do. Um, you know, I can remember days that, uh, you know, my parents dropped me off at the ski mountain and, uh, you know, you weren't terribly enthusiastic, but they said, well, I'll be back to pick you up at four 30. So, uh, you went and did it. Um, but you know, it was a great group of people. I still have friends from when I ski raced, uh, really close friends. Uh, in fact, uh, one of them I spent the weekend with, um, you know, it is, as I said, something that, um, I really enjoy doing still today. Um, my wife and I are both avid backcountry skiers. We run a lot and, uh, we spend a lot of time, as much time as possible during the winter on the slopes. Yeah, lovely. Okay, thank you. And um, so tell me, I just want to take it back a little bit um, to um, a few years you were growing up. I uh, just want to understand a little bit more about what your major influences were as you were growing up. You know, the, I suppose the, the influences that helped shape your ideas and aspirations, um, you know, as a young kind of Dexter Payne. Uh, so I, uh, grew up by ski race. I went to Williams college, uh, to ski race. Um, and when I finished Williams, um, I went to work for bankers trust and I was mm. lucky enough at bankers trust to be put in their leverage finance group was, was in 1983. Um, and it was a relatively nascent group, um, and had the opportunity, uh, with that group, which was, uh, responsible for an, uh, lending money to buyout firms to work very closely with 
KKR, Citicorp Venture Capital, uh, First Chicago, um, many of the early buyout uh, firms. Um, and in 1987, moved from lending uh, to those businesses uh, to the principal side of the business. Um, first at Roberts and Stevens, and then I went to work for Jerry Kohlberg at Kohlberg and Company. Um, Jerry, as most people know, was the founding partner of KKR, left KKR in 87 to found his own firm, Kohlberg and Company. Uh, Jerry was an enormous influence on my life. He was a wonderful person. He was an incredibly good investor. He was a great listener, uh, and he really empowered the people around him, um, but also spent time mentoring, mentoring and teaching people how to be a good investor. Uh, and that was really a formative time in my life in terms of uh, learning the private equity industry. Um, in 97, I went to work uh, with a guy by the name of Saul Fox, who had been a partner at uh, KKR, and he and I formed uh, the predecessor to Payne Schwartz, which was Fox Payne. In 2001, uh, Kevin Schwartz joined the firm. And in 2005, when Saul retired, Kevin and I uh, were the founders of Payne Schwartz. And so uh, Kevin and I, my partner today and the CEO of Payne Schwartz, have worked together for almost 20 years um, and have built a firm um, into uh, the preeminent investor in food and ag in the private equity business globally. Um, but I would have to say that the single most influential individual on my career in terms of professional career uh, was Jerry Colbert. Um, okay. He really, uh, was an incredible mentor, incredible person, um, you know, taught me lots of things that made me a better person in terms of my day-to-day -day life, as well as taught me to be an investor and taught me about the private equity world. Yeah, no, that's great. And when you um, set up, uh, so I was having a look at the, web, the website, Fox Payne at the time, um, it wasn't a pure play agri firm, I take it. It was a little bit more general in terms of the, the investment you did, I take it. Yeah, um, so the first time I invested in the food and ag industry was actually when I was at Colburn Company and I worked on two different deals in the ag space. Uh, the first was a business called Sunseeds, uh, and the second was a business called Color Spot. Um, and so I had had some experience investing in the food and ag space. Uh, when we formed Fox Payne, Saul was really uh, came out of the financial services industry, so that was an area that we did work. Um, I had done some work and had really grown to be passionate about food and ag. Uh, when I was a Colberg and company. So that was another one of our verticals. And then we had a general um, vertical in sort of industrials. Um, it was when Kevin and I um, formed Payne Schwartz that we really began to focus on the food and ag industry. Kevin grew up um, in Moline. His dad was treasurer of John Deere. Um, and I had done some work, um, as I said, investing in food and ag. And then Kevin and I had actually invested in two food and ag businesses while we were at uh, Fox Payne. The first was a business called Seminus, which was the largest vegetable seed business in the world, which uh, we sold to Monsanto. And the second was a business called Advanta, which was a uh, business um, also in the seed industry um, that we sold as well. Uh, and so it was the work the two of us did on those businesses that really convinced us that there was an incredible opportunity investing in food and ag. I mean, you know, the industry has really compelling underlying demographics. Um, as we talked about earlier in the podcast, um, it's very resilient uh, in terms of uh, avoiding um, downturns in the economy as people, mm. regardless of what's going on with the broader economy. Um, and we decided, since no one out there had focused, that we could be the preeminent firm in that space. And we've been able to execute on the vision we had in 2005 uh, when uh, he and I founded uh, the firm. Got it. Yeah. In fact, I saw in the video, I think Kevin mentions, um, I think global gross output, food and ag is maybe responsible for something like 8% um, of that output. 
Whereas when it comes to deal flow in private equity, it's something like one or two percent, as it were. So it seems that it's not always um, food and ag not well represented uh, from a private equity viewpoint. And I wonder what, what, why that was. I think at the time um, it was driven by a couple of factors. One is um, it was an industry that historically has been controlled by families and was very fragmented. So. Um, in the private equity world where you waited for a banker to call you with an idea. Um, it was an industry that was very hard to access. Um, second, I think people always associated food and ag with commodities. So they thought about corn and soy and thought, wow, there's a lot of risk. You know, you've spent a lot of time in the ag industry. There are segments that are impacted by commodities, but there's lots of parts of the food and ag value chain that have no correlation with corn prices or soy prices. So, you know, you think about, I'd mentioned we'd invested in a couple of seed businesses. You know, one of them, Seminus, is in the fruit and vegetable seed business. There's no correlation between tomato prices or cucumber prices or the price of seeds uh, to what's going on in the larger corn and soy commodity markets. Um, and so you need to pick and choose where in that value chain you want to play. Um, but there's many places uh, that, as I said, do not have the kind of commodity risk that most people associate with the industry. Um, and finally, you know, it's a funny thing, but if you went to Goldman Sachs in 2005, said, we want to speak to your agricultural banker, they'd say, who? Um, you know, they had a chemical banker who covered the big fertilizer businesses, they had a CPG banker who covered the food companies. Um, and unlike oil and gas or healthcare or technology, there wasn't a focus in these banks. And so, you know, it made it very difficult to generate deal flow. We had always, always had a much more proactive approach to deal flow generation, which was to identify segments that we think are really attractive and to go out and call directly on those companies. So even today, we spend time identifying sectors that we want to be involved with. We have eight what we call hunting grounds in the firm. Um, and those hunting grounds are places that we want to make investments. And we go out and proactively call on companies, on management teams, on founders in those segments to generate ideas. And so I think it's a bit of a different approach to generating investment ideas than other firms have. And 15 years ago, it lent itself very well to food and ag because there weren't a lot of bankers in that sector. You know, today, the market's become a lot, a lot more efficient. You've actually had a lot more private equity firms decide that the food and ag space is one that they like. Uh, but we were able to get out ahead and we've been able to use that expertise and knowledge that we have um, to really grow the business. Uh, over the last, uh, you know, 15 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was it about the the actual um, food and ag that really attracted you, you know, as, a, as an industry itself? Uh, it's back to some of the things we talked about before. Um, one, you know, it's a sector that has grown more rapidly uh, than other sectors over the last 15 years. I think if you look back over the last 10 years, um, it's been the second largest, uh, second fastest growing sector um, globally. Uh, it's a sector, as you mentioned earlier, that represented about 8% of global GDP, which is larger than healthcare or oil and gas. Um, and therefore, there is a tremendous number of places you can put capital to work. And finally, you know, it's a segment that has been very resilient. You know, you look back over the last 10 years, and we've had two downturns. This was even pre-COVID. Um, and this sector, the food sector, uh, grew through each one of those and never had a down year. Um, there's very few parts of the economy that are that robust and resilient. Um, and you know, it was all those things that really attracted us. Ultimately, we like to say, you know, people have to eat. We haven't yet found a replacement for food. And, um, you know, that makes for very good underlying demographics in the industry. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And well, with there being now such a focus on sustainable investing, I mean, certainly over the last few months, reading about it everywhere, um, how, you know, how does this impact deploying capital at sensible valuations when everyone kind of focused on this topic? So let me break that question down into two pieces. Um, the first is the question about sustainability. Um, you know, it's, sustainability has been something we've really focused on um, at the firm. Uh, we just got our PRI score back and we received an A um, from PRI. Uh, you know, we're a signatory of the United Nations um, uh, document. Um, I think that it is, um, not just important, but necessary in the food and ag business to have a focus on sustainability. Um, and we produce a sustainability report for our investors every year um, that speaks to what our portfolio companies are doing to combat um, you know, challenges, whether it's climate change or water consumption or uh, food waste, um, and we try to measure how we're improving at our portfolio companies each and every year. Um, in terms of the second question, which is valuations, um, certainly one of the things that's driven the increased valuations in food and ag has been this perception that it's a highly sustainable industry um, and this desire for private equity firms in general, uh, or sorry, specifically, but you know, investors in general to be much more focused on ESG than they've historically been. Um, I think though, what's really driven valuations in the food and ag space has been that people have discovered the size of the industry. People have discovered the resiliency. People have discovered the growth characteristics. Um, and quite frankly, people have made a lot of money investing in food and ag, uh, both private equity and public investors. Um, and that's driven more money into the segment. Um, you know, there's some broader macro issues that have continued to drive valuations, such as low interest rates, but that's really impacted all sectors. I think there are some really specific items um, that have impacted and driven up valuations in the food and ag sector. Um, you know, unfortunately for us on the buy side, um, I don't see any of those um, macro um, factors changing dramatically. I think that, you know, we'll continue to see growth in food consumption. Uh, we'll continue to see the sector be one of the most resilient sectors out there. We'll, you know, likely continue to see low interest rates for a time being. Um, so we're, as much as we'd like to see valuations come down, um, I think we're realistic about the fact that valuations will continue to be, um, uh, you know, relatively high uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, the good news is we own a portfolio of companies and when we go to sell those companies, um, we'll be able to sell them at valuations that are significantly above what we paid for them um, a few years ago. Absolutely, so this is fund five where you're, you're currently deploying it's capital. Fund five, moment. we just raised our fifth fund, closed a year ago, a billion 425. Um, and, uh, you know, our goal is to is to invest about four hundred million dollars of equity per year. Um, we also do a fair amount of co invest with our LPs, where they invest with us. Um, and uh, you know, our um, you know, as a firm, uh, we'd like to do three to four transactions a year um, out of this fund um, and invest the fund. You know, over the next uh, two to three years. Go ahead. Okay, and, and all the investments are related to, to, to growth investing? Uh, we do both growth investing and traditional buyout investing. So the last deal we did is um, we invested in a public company called Agrifresh, which is a leader in um, reducing waste um, in uh, four companies that harvest fruits, um, Agrifresh, so it's incredibly well positioned from a sustainability perspective. Um, Agrifresh uh, is a company that went public. It had some balance sheet challenges 
Um, we invested in a preferred security and own about a third of the business, uh, as well as have significant um, representation on the board of that company. That's a transaction that closed in July. Um, prior to that, we bought a significant equity interest in the largest grape genetics business in the world, um, which is based in Spain. Um, Agrofest is based in the US. Um, so that just really shows you the types of businesses that we're putting into fund uh, five. Um, and you know, both are uh, companies with significant revenues and earnings, uh, positive cash flow generators. Um, and that's our typical investment. <coughs> we do some growth investing uh, in the food and ag sector, uh, but the bulk of what we do is buying either uh, majority or significant minority interests in businesses that have real revenues and earnings uh, in the food and ag sector. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And wait, with regards to maybe the change of emphasis in sustainability, because you spoke there about AgroSafe and you know, some of the kind of challenges with food waste, for instance, and the problems that this technology really solves, as it were. So um, it's interesting seeing you invest in those, you know, those types of business that are really addressing those issues. Has the fund, um, has there been more of a focus from fund one to five on you know, the very nature of the businesses being sustainable and solving some of these societal and environmental issues? I don't think that we've really changed our focus. Uh, we've done a much better job, quite frankly, in articulating why these businesses are highly sustainable. Um, but, you know, we bought a business in fund three um, called Scambia, um, which takes uh, marine byproduct. So the cuttings from salmon factories or pelagic um, and processes those back into fish meal and fish oil that's used to feed fish, feed cows, feed pigs, um, you know, fairly highly sustainable product. Historically, that was um, those cuttings and waste, uh, marine waste were thrown back into the ocean. And today, you know, rather than throwing 50% of the salmon back into the ocean, we're using 100% of that fish for a highly sustainable person, purpose. You know, that's an investment we made in 2010. Um, so, you know, once again, that was 10 years ago, great business. Um, you know, at the time we invested in what we thought was a great business. Today, we articulate why we invested in a great business, but also why such a great business is so well positioned from mm. a need perspective. We're much better at marketing that. And look, the company's gotten much better at being focused on how to provide those services in a highly sustainable way. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, interesting. I mean, clearly you're investing in um, you know, people, you're investing in businesses. I, I, I'm interested from your viewpoint when you're assessing an organization or you're, you're investing in an organization, you know, for you, what are the, you know, what, what are the key things, the traits and the characteristics that make a world-class management team that come to mind for you? Um, let me... I think you were asking, what are the things we look for when we um, go to buy a business? Yeah. And the first thing we look for is a world-class management team. You know, we think there is nothing more important than having the right management team um, in a business. Um, now, sometimes that means you buy the business and uh, work very closely with the existing management team. Sometimes we have family businesses that come to us and say, we want to get out. And part of getting out is, you know, you need to go find a new manager to run this business. Sometimes we'll do a spin out from a public company or a large company and need to find a management team to run it. So, you know, we um, have a head of human talent at our firm, uh, a woman by the name of Renata Dinkelman, who's incredibly important to what we do. Um, you know, we try to work with our teams, uh, our management teams, um, to, uh, grow these businesses, um, where that team isn't the right team, we will go augment it or help 
uh, CEO hire new people into their organization. Um, you know, in terms of other characteristics we look for, you know, we like high growth businesses. We like businesses with high margins. We like businesses that produce really strong free cash flow. Um, I think, you know, in our industry, um, that ability to take revenues and produce free cash flow from those revenues is a really important metric as we think about what makes for successful businesses. Um, and, you know, we like businesses um, that have the opportunity to grow either organically, that might be geographic, new um, businesses, or one of the things we've done very successfully over time is grow through acquisitions. So we tend to be very aggressive working with our management teams in identifying new acquisitions that can add new products, new geographies, uh, and are complementary to the business. And you know, we try to provide the capital that sometimes these businesses didn't have before that will allow them to go out and be very aggressive in terms of um, growing businesses. Yeah, no, thank you. And tell me, after you know, 30 years investing in the space, uh, well, investing and 20 odd years plus in the food and egg space, you know, Fund 5 now, you're deploying, as you've mentioned, $1.425 billion worth of capital. Well, what really gets you excited, gets you out of bed in the morning excited, you know, about your job and, you know, about this, uh, you know, about the investing? I get to work with a incredible group of people um, and have been able to um, use this as an opportunity to um, identify um, great folks to work with. Um, sorry, my video went off for a second. Um, and have um, been able to build a firm uh, with my partner, Kevin Schwartz, and with Angela Stasios, who's our chief investment officer, um, that is 50 plus people um, from nothing when we started the firm. Um, and, you know, I'm incredibly passionate about um, the industry that we invest in. Um, you know, I think I would feel differently if I were in a business that uh, wasn't uh, as exciting, wasn't as dynamic, quite frankly, wasn't in, as important to feeding the world as this one is. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, it's really stimulating uh, in terms of looking at lots of different businesses. Um, you know, getting up in the morning and being able to work with lots of management teams from different geographies. Um, I consider myself an incredibly lucky person to have a job that... Uh, or uh, something I'm really passionate about um, that really has a positive impact on the world, uh, both in terms of, um, you know, being highly sustainable um, and being able to work with uh, great people. Uh, excellent. Uh, very good. And, um, and just a couple of other things. Um, we were talking earlier about it as well with, with Rick, we were talking about uh, um, global uh, global orientation. You know the, the companies you invest in, the complexity of the the value chain and the supply chain with food takes you all around the world, as it were. Um, you know how how much of a challenge is that working with different geographies, different cultures, different people, and uh, you know learning and adapting to you know to those cultures. The good news about the food and ag industry is it's a global industry. And so, you know, growing uh, tomatoes in Italy um, isn't terribly different than growing tomatoes in uh, California. Um, you know, the cultures and dealing with different cultures, um, you know, is a real skill. And it's one of the things you asked me earlier, what's really fun about this job it's one of the things that's really fun about this job mm. um, is dealing with different people from different cultures. Um, but, you know, how people work, um, when they work, um, and, you know, particularly a 
you know, about 80% of our businesses are family owned businesses, you know, how families operate in different areas um, is very different. And it is one of the things that makes this job so interesting is no deal, no company, no ownership structure is the same. Um, everyone has its unique challenges. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, it's really easy in certain geographies to deal with the legal system or with, uh, you know, subsidies or um, with, you know, family or tax issues. Um, and you know, you're never quite sure um, when you meet a team or you go into a new geography, how are you gonna solve those problems? Um, but you know, we consider one of our great skills, our creativity, our willingness to listen, our ability to solve problems, particularly for families. Um, and it's one of the things that I think has made us a really attractive buyer um, to people who are looking at selling their businesses in the food and ag industry. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. And, um, and tell me, when you're hiring for, for, for your company, for Paint Schwartz, you know, what are the non-negotiable key things that, you know, maybe the top three things you look for, you know, when hiring, as it were? So when we're thinking about hiring in the firm, um, you know, we start with really basic skills, which is um, people need to be smart, they need to be analytical. Um, they need to be passionate about being successful. Um, and, you know, they need to be willing to work hard. Um, I think I gave you four things. Um, but, you know, those are the things that really are at the top of the list. Um, we can teach people about the food and ag industry. Um, we can teach people, hopefully, through good mentoring and to be good investors. Um, but the skills I just talked about are skills that's really hard to teach people. Yeah. Uh, and if they haven't, and we do our job uh, coaching, mentoring, um, we'll produce good investors and ultimately, you know, create a firm that exists long after I've moved on to doing something else. Um, and that's really the goal. Oh, got it. Yeah, I don't think I can picture you doing something else, to be honest. I think you're so like uh, passionate about this. I, I was, it came across my mind earlier. I just can't imagine you in a retired capacity, for sure. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine myself in a retired capacity either. Um, I really love this. Um, you know, we've been able to evolve the firm where Kevin runs it day to day. I get to do all the things that I love doing. And uh, it's absolutely terrific. And as I said, you know, we have really motivated, smart, fun people uh, at the firm. Um, and, you know, trying to create um, a firm where people are really excited about coming to work that has a great culture um, is one of the things that I get really excited about. Mm. Now that's great. So we'll be no doubt talking about this type of topic in about 20 years still, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe we'll be around fun number eight or something along those lines. Uh, uh, I hope that's the case. <laughs> but listen, it's been brilliant. I really appreciate you spending the time. It's, it's been a great discussion. I uh, really appreciate the insights. So thanks for sharing. Well, Simon, thank you very much for taking the time and inviting me to be part of this podcast. I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, really look forward to working with you. You've uh, been fun to build a relationship and certainly your uh, um, knowledge um, and passion for the, the, the industry uh, is uh, as high as mine is. So uh, oh, it's really fun uh, spending time with you. Thank you oh. for having me today.